what not to learn from Galileo. For the uh, past um, three weeks, more or less, uh, we've been talking about uh, Galileo and uh, some of the things we can learn from the Galileo experience. One of the things that we started out learning was that one cannot fully trust history, even history based on original documents, because the documents are not only sometimes hard to find, but they are sometimes actually deliberately fudged. And agendas on both sides of a dispute can keep an, a falsehood alive when the truth should have vanquished it some time ago. Galileo, in fact, was not the hero that uh, science makes him out to be because he was not severely punished the way the church tried to make him out to be. Um, just, you have to be careful, uh, especially about things that start to border on hagiography. Um, people aren't always quite as good or as bad as uh, they're painted to be. We have also learned that the Galileo story makes it quite difficult to believe in the authority of the Pope, papal bulls, um, uh, can be an error, and uh, it's difficult for me to conceive of a uh, way of restricting the authority of the Pope to where it won't include what the Pope deliberately says when uh, supposedly uh, exercising his doctrinal authority. We have also learned that sometimes the simplest and the most apparent meaning of Scripture can be odds, at odds with apparent scientific truth, and I would say at odds with what appears to be, in fact, the real scientific truth. And that we have to be careful about how we read the scriptures. Um, it appears that some ideas can occasionally be wrong. Um, and uh, <coughs> today, we'll discuss a lesson from Galileo that many want us to learn that, in my opinion, we should not. Andrew Dixon White wrote a book called History of the Warfare Between Science and Theology in Christendom in 1896. It was a continuation of the thought of a, a more popular book written by John Draper, which was called History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science, published in 1874. What made uh, Andrew Dixon White's um, book more uh, impressive, even though it wasn't as popular at the time, was that John da Draper didn't have any notes. He just wrote what he thought, and uh, uh, if you believed him, then you believed him, and if you didn't, you just kind of blew it off. Andrew Dixon White cited authority after authority after authority. You could see where he got his stories from. And uh, that bit of scholarship is what made White's book the most influential in the end. The thesis of Andrew Dixon White's book was that Galileo's conflict with the church was, in fact, a paradigm of such conflict in general. That there was a religion, or as he would put it, dogmatic theology, and science would come in conflict again and again and again, and whenever it happened, science always won. A uh, quick scan of the chapters of his book will illustrate what I'm talking about. From Creation to Evolution was his first chapter, which is kind of interesting. Uh, geography, talking about um, the shape of the earth and uh, the shape of the known world. Astronomy, which is where Galileo came in, and this is where he really pulled his, if I could put it that way, his ace card. Then from signs and wonders to laws in the heavens, the old pre, uh, 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 if I can put it that way, uh, uh, pre-scientific way of looking at things. Um, that comets were, in fact, uh, he heavenly bodies that had nothing to do with um, uh, God's signs on Earth. 
from Genesis to Geology, um, uh, more of a uh, time frame argument than the uh, uh, biological mechanism argument. The Antiquity of Man, two chapters, um, and The Fall of Man, three chapters that argued against the traditional doctrine of the fall. Uh, from the Prince of the Power of the Air to Meteorology, what makes the weather go, uh, is, it, is it God or the devil or is it uh, natural law? Then uh, I am missing a slide and I don't know what happened here. There are several other chapters that follow in the same vein. And the final one is from uh, uh, from the inspired oracles to higher criticism. And so when Andrew Dixon White goes on, he wants to undermine the authority of the Bible itself. Galileo, along with all the other cases, showed that whenever religion and science came in conflict, religion always lost. Uh, and the kind of Conclusion to that is you might as well get ahead of the curve and disregard religious knowledge because as soon as science gets involved, it's going to turn out to be wrong. Now the question is, is that really fair? Is this really true? The Galileo Affair, I do, do think, showed that propositions that are apparently assumed by biblical writers but not actually taught by them could be wrong. The question is, does it therefore follow that all knowledge found in the Bible can be disregarded, including ideas that are explicitly taught? And that's the question. And one of the easiest ways to, to show that the question has a negative answer is to find a counterexample. So with that in mind, we're going to look at some counterexamples. First of all, in, to be very precise, the Galileo Affair was not really about science versus religion, in a sense. Um, Galileo was himself religious. Most of the people on both sides of that question were religious. Um, there were people who would normally be classified as scientists on the other side of the question. Um, and so what you're, uh, uh, what you're really looking at is a conflict within religion and science. And uh, most of the other questions that were raised by uh, Andrew Dixon White were in fact uh, not really science re versus religion completely either for the same reasons. Um, there are scientists on both sides. There are theologians on both sides. What it really is about is naturalistic versus supernaturalistic philosophy, and Galileo doesn't even fit that. Um, and so the lesson that I'm, that I'm suggesting we do not learn, um, basically what I'm, what I'm going to say to support that we should not learn that lesson is that scientific and historical hypotheses arising from and are compatible with supernaturalistic philosophy, sometimes have considerably more empirical support than hypotheses arising from and are compatible with naturalistic philosophy. And I think even more importantly, that sometimes the support that they have has increased with time. That is to say, if you're trying to, to find something, you find a, a problem that looks like it's a problem for a revealed uh, religion. Give it time, it solves itself and becomes a problem for those who do not wish to believe in revealed religion. The first example I'm going to use is the uh, numbers for the kings of Israel and Judah and their reigns in uh, First Kings. 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, and 2 Chronicles uh, were used to prove that the history was hopelessly confused because nobody could fit the numbers together. Um, 
the skeptical way of looking at things was, well, this is, of course the numbers don't fit because they're all made up anyway. And uh, you can find people who said that flat out, including Julius Wellhausen. Uh, um, in 1983, the, uh, this is the third edition, actually it's in 19, I think 51 or so that the, that the, uh, uh, that the first of, the, uh, of his articles came out. Edwin Thiele wrote the mysterious numbers of the Hebrew kings and managed to fit all but a very few of those together. A few more have been fit together since the scheme does not fit all the numbers together, which means that it appears from the data we have that there are, in fact, errors in, in this, these numbers as well. But in spite of the fact that the biblical history has not been shown to be inerrant, it is still true that this chronology with the possibility of errors in the original data, was able to be able to serve as a corrective for secular history in a number of different times. Um, perhaps the most striking one was when uh, Thiele said that uh, Sargon the Great, who claimed to have captured Samaria, in fact did not because it was captured by his predecessor, Shalmaneser III. And Thiele turned out to be right and the monuments turned out to be wrong. And when you can argue with the monuments and win, you've done pretty well. Um, Paul, we yes. might mention Edwin Thiele was a professor of religion at Andrews University. That's correct. Uh, what's even more interesting is that Thiele didn't start out by taking all the secular data that he could and then trying to fit the biblical chronology around it. What he actually did was delve into the biblical chronology in a, in a deeper way than anybody had done before, managed to fit all but uh, about, uh, I think, five or six data points, which two or three have uh, been fit in since, uh, into his chronology, and then went back to the secular data and found that it suggested that the, uh, that the Assyrian chronology was expanded by one year, and it suggested that two or three places where the Assyrian chronology would normally have been assumed to prove one thing, in fact, uh, it fit in a different direction. Um, the contact of Menahem with Syria is one of them. And um, so there are at least five dates that uh, the Bible has served to correct Assyrian chronology. Again, that's not exactly the lesson that people want you to learn from Galileo. Uh, the book of Daniel is uh, perhaps uh, also interesting because the skeptics would allege that Belshazzar never existed, that the history of and the chronology of Daniel was hopelessly confused, and there was no point in looking for Daniel and his three companions because they were all imaginary uh, uh, creations of the literary book anyway. And Belshazzar has been found, and in fact is now known to have been the crown prince at the time, which makes his offer of Daniel to be the third ruler in the kingdom perfectly sensible because Nabonidus was number one, Belshazzar was number two, and so Daniel was being offered the, uh, the number three position, which was the highest that uh, Belshazzar had to give. The chronology of Nebuchadnezzar has turned out to be amazingly correct. Uh, we discovered Nebuchadnezzar's own annals, and it turns out that the skeptics were hyper-skeptical at this point. They've been the ones that have had to back off, not the biblical record. And finally, Daniel and his three friends um, have apparently been found. Um, uh, Bill Shea has a couple of articles in 1982 and 1988 
uh, detailing, finding uh, uh, the uh, three Hebrew worthies and, uh, uh, and Daniel himself. And perhaps what's even more interesting is that what he fa the text that he found the three worthies in, in fact, had been translated into English in a standard work, um, uh, ancient Near Eastern texts, uh, by Pritchard. Uh, for some 25 years before uh, Bill Shea found them, I went back and looked at it after I, uh, uh, after I uh, realized that this was the text he was wanting to do, and I could find them myself. The power of the paradigm says, don't look there because there won't be any point. Somebody who takes a biblical record seriously says, maybe we should look. And the maybe we should look uh, philosophy turns out to be the more useful one. Uh, medical science, this is one that Adventists probably have more than other Christians, um, but uh, there are visions that talked about tobacco being a uh, deadly poison that uh, advocated vegetarianism, and of course, the Adventist lifestyle itself has proven to be um, uh, one that uh, encourages long life. Um, of all the blue zones, ours is the only blue zone where people can enter and leave at will. Rather fascinating. The, uh, I the interesting thing about, um, about the medical science end of things is that the practical proposals that were made by Ellen White are much more often corroborated by science than the proposed mechanisms. And some of the proposed mechanisms look to us today like rather foolishness. Um, but the, uh, but the uh, lifestyle choices that are advocated turn out to be extremely good. And in one case, they're uh, over 96% corroborated by modern science. Uh, that differential between the reasons why and the recommended course of action was actually predicted on my, uh, in my uh, book, Scientific Theology, in the section on inspiration and revelation. Um, now, that's, of course, medical science. It's science for today. Well, what about specifically the idea of origins? Well, in cosmology, the idea that the universe had a beginning was at first thought to be um, a non-starter. But, um, and, and there were those who fought the idea that the universe had a beginning in science, whereas now it's pretty hard to avoid. Now what happened at that point is disputed and uh, uh, there are ways of desperately trying to avoid the implications, um, but they're looking increasingly desperate as time goes on. In biology, the idea of vestigial organs is one which has not stood the test of time. This was once used as a proof that uh, that uh, whatever created the body was not very intelligent and uh, made uh, multiple uh, mistakes. And uh, uh, when uh, one organism changed to another, there were leftover pieces that uh, uh, couldn't be used. And uh, some of those included the thymus, the pituitary, and the appendix, all of which, of course, have uh, uses now. Um, What's say, even more interesting is that the spleen was thought to be a, an evolutionary leftover in humans and dogs. It uh, uh, contains enough blood to give a transfusion in case the dog gets uh, injured and loses a lot of blood. Uh, in humans, it can't function that way, essentially. And uh, 
For that reason, when people were in automobile accidents, the spleen was routinely taken out. Oh, sometimes uh, if they got in there and it just looked like there was a big hematoma and it might rupture any time, you never know, um, they'd take it out. Nowadays, they leave it in because we have discovered that, in fact, the spleen, even in adults, has a function. And people who have the spleen out are much more liable to get uh, things like overwhelming sepsis from pneumococcus or uh, meningococcus. Having the spleen in turns out to be a very good thing. And nowadays, people are very conservative about taking the spleen out. And sometimes, if they are forced to take it out because it's just totally shattered, they will take little pieces of it and implant them in the omentum and hope that they will uh, get a blood supply because a little filtering is better than none. Um, that same problem crops up with junk DNA, which was originally pr predicted to be about 97% of the genome. And uh, that percentage has been steadily shrinking. And uh, it's, there are several predictions that one can find in the literature that, in fact, junk DNA would probably mostly be, turn out to be useful. Uh, that's from uh, creationists, of course, whereas the standard prediction uh, from the, uh, from the uh, evolutionary community was that junk DNA was just a leftover from evolution. Well, as time has gone on, the creationist prediction has stood up pretty well. The evolutionary prediction has had to have been backed off on. Now, that kind of argument that science always wins when there's a science-religion uh, conflict um, is used in two ways. One of them is uh, when people are just about at the end of uh, saying, uh, and you should be an evolutionist, an atheist, a uh, full-blown non-theist, uh, as a kind of a summary of what's going on. That's how Andrew Dixon White used it, that we're all winning, you're losing, you might as well quit. Or the other time that it comes up, interestingly, is when it looks like there's a pretty good challenge from religion to science. Um, again, I'm using those terms loosely because of obviously they're both science and they're both uh, involved in religion. Um, but to say supernaturalism, where supernaturalism has a, uh, a good argument against the naturalism. Uh, the classic one is the origin of life. And they'll say, but just wait, you know, uh, we'll eventually get it, and when we do, well, you're going to have to eat your words. Uh, there is, in fact, massive evidence suggesting that intelligent design is the best explanation for the origin of life. Um, intelligent design certainly can account for um, at least long strings of DNA, for example. There's no known mechanism. There's no reasonably plausible mechanism uh, to account for long strings of very specific DNA without intelligent design being involved. But if that is intelligent design, if you take that conclusion, then it's really intelligent design. The original design is better than us because we're having trouble reproducing it. We barely managed to reproduce some parts of it, even with the models in front of us. And the original intelligent designer would have had to have made up the whole thing without uh, any models in front of him or her. And uh, I think that it really is a backbreaker for naturalism. And uh, in fact, this is one case where you can't even be a deist. You have to be a theist because the intervention that is needed is such that it couldn't have happened, let's say, at the Big Bang where everything is then just left to run its natural course. God has to actually step into the universe 
and work his, his way. But there is a commitment on the side of those who lean towards naturalism that isn't always appreciated. Uh, Robert Shapiro in 1986 wrote uh, what I think is still a very good introduction to the subject of origins. He covers all the theories and is very careful to uh, not advocate any theory that doesn't actually uh, merit support, which means that <laughs> he winds up not uh, supporting any theory very well. Um, but in page 130, he, uh, he indicates his own prejudice, the way he wants to look at things. Some future day may yet arrive when all reasonable chemical experiments run to discover a probable origin for life have failed unequivocally. That means there's no experiments. Not only are there are no experiments supporting the origin of life on a, from a naturalistic point of view, but we've run all the reasonably conceivable experiments. Further, new geologic evidence may indicate a sudden appearance of life on Earth. Didn't happen over millions of years. Happened over maybe less than a thousand. Finally, we may have explored the universe and found no trace of life or processes leading to life elsewhere. Now you can see that this is a hypothetical that's not going to be fulfilled in our lifetime. In such a case, some scientists might choose to turn to religion for an answer. If they're totally, 100% pinned to the wall, they might accept religion. Others, however, myself included, would attempt to sort out the surviving, less probable scientific explanations in the hope of selecting one that was still more likely than the remainder. How much more can you say, I'm not going there regardless of the evidence? That's commitment. The fact of the matter is, as we have seen, that religion does not always lose. That Andrew Dixon White, in fact, was wrong. And... Uh, even in the cases that he mentioned, he may have been overenthusiastic. That, in fact, we should not learn from Galileo that religion always <coughs> loses and that we should just give up religion because of that or perhaps adopt a religion that makes no testable claims. A <coughs> sort of a liberal uh, feel-good approach to religion. And with that, I will invite uh, questions or comments, and there are a couple microphones there. Uh, um, Ariel. Uh, just of general interest, a couple of headlines I picked up uh, this week are related to this is that in Korea, there is a suggestion that they will no longer teach evolution there. Uh, of course, they're afraid of the uh, accusation of not being scientific, but uh, Korea is, uh, ha has a strong Christian component. You you're you're talking about South Korea. South Korea, yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I'd yeah. rather think that the North Koreans are probably not on uh, board with that. This would probably not happen in North Korea, <laughs> as we know it. Uh, and uh, secondly, a recent Gallup poll, uh, Jeff mentioned uh, I think to us and so on, you know, figure 45 percent of adults in the United States keep saying that they believe that God created man in the last 10,000 years. Uh, this thing is not drifting very much. Now, there's another factor in that survey that shows a little bit of drifting, but uh, that particular issue seems to be staying by. But well, the, the, the atheists are slowly gaining ground. Uh, They've gone from, I think, uh, 8 to 9 to about 15. Yeah, that one has changed a little bit uh, and so on. But uh, uh, this is not an issue that seems to be dying down in any way whatsoever. 
And of course, you know, state legislators keep suggesting that Kansas, uh, again, this week a notice about Kansas, they, they're preparing for another round uh, like they've had before and uh, so on. But that's not what I wanted to get at today. I'm getting back to your, to your discussion here. Uh, there is a, uh, following Shapiro's thinking a little bit, uh, and in opposition to Andrew Dickinson White, you know, talks about the warfare between science and religion. There are some historians who take the position that uh, there is no warfare uh, because these are separate issues entirely. Uh, science is, of course, the superior issue in, in their thinking, and religion, well, that, that's okay, it, it deals, you know, morality and so on, science doesn't deal with this, uh, and we're going to pursue science, uh, per se, and of course, uh, Stephen Gould and his uh, uh, talk about the two magisteria, uh, science and religion, was pursuing that, that route also, and in doing that, uh, what science does is, uh, in approving of this, is to exclude a significant segment of reality, uh, and, and they're hoping to uh, stick to a purely materialistic philosophy and go, go on with uh, truth, as, as Shapiro suggested he might do, uh, per se. And I, I, I think this is a, an interesting approach, but I think it is fruitless. You're much more likely to find truth uh, if you have many possibilities and if you exclude some as not being part of your uh, reliable reference. I think it's so much better to, to go the way uh, uh, you suggested, for instance, that uh, uh, look, th th look at the science. The science tells you there's got to be, it, it, science is not working. The mathematics, the probabilities, the biochemistry and so on, all that's together in the original life, it's not working. Uh, much better to, to uh, go that route uh, and be willing to and broaden out your possibilities uh, in reality and so on and uh, come to a an answer that is probably more congruent with uh, uh, what we might call reality. We, we all know we have morality. Uh, we have a sense of right and wrong, whether you're an evolutionist or a creationist, you have a sense of right and wrong, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, th this, uh, th let's admit, there's something beyond the materialistic. Yeah. <coughs> To me, an, an odd thing about what's going on now is that make a comparison in the, in the Middle Ages, you either believe what you're told to believe or you die. That is, you believe what the papacy says or you die. Uh, well, not to that point, but we're, we're back at a point, you know, the people threw that off finally, but we're back at a point where science says you either accept what we say or you simply are ruled out as having any relevance. And you cannot, you know, don't pretend to be a scientist. And if you um, get grants, uh, you can forget about that. Yeah. So, so why do does science have to depend on these assumptions? Why can't um, we say, okay, I, you know, I don't agree with you, but you're you're free to follow what you want to do. If somebody believes that that they can find a mechanism for the origin of life without God, I don't have any problem with that. Let them pursue it. I think there'll be a dead end. But why should I object? So why should they object? if another person has a different point of view. Why can't science be an, an open thinking process? And of course, we can think of reasons why this happens. That you know, if, you, if you let that open that door, you open the door to God. But uh, th you know, there are all kinds of people and all kinds of reasons. But this is a really odd thing about science today. Well, what's even more interesting is that, at least in some circumstances, um, opening the door to not only God but also to such things as the traditional uh, teaching about the age of life on earth uh, has, has allowed experiments to be done that one supported the uh, 
hypothesis and two would never have been done under the standard regime. I'm thinking particularly about uh, Clyde Webster's experiments on uh, Euro, uh, uranium rolfant deposits. Uh, where they were demonstrated to be able to be produced within about eight months, if I understand correctly, where nobody from a long age perspective would have thought to do it. And the, the results certainly are supportive of the idea that, uh, that uh, uranium rail fronts deposits don't take all that much time, and certainly not millions of years. And I think that that's... Uh, you know, when you can do science based on a theory and the, the results come out as expected, I think that you're starting to get into uh, the, the real essence of science. I, I'm sure you can add a few more examples to that. There is an equal amount of ignorance in religion I was reading in the Liberty Magazine this morning about the resurgence of Sunday blue laws, particularly in North Dakota. They took an old law and they're burnishing it to present to us today, and they insist it has nothing to do with religion, although the law pertains from midnight Saturday until noon on Sunday. In that period of time, you're not able to purchase things or open your shop or, or do work, uh, various things, and they insist from the Pope on down, it has nothing to do with religion. It is for the good of family and against greed to keep you from being at, looking for money all the time in your life. And it's just ludicrous. You check the history of Sunday laws, it's all about keeping the Lord's Day. And, but they're refusing to, refusing to believe this or refusing to admit to it. And it makes religion look stupid. Well, it makes some kinds of religion look stupid. Other kinds that might... Uh be opposed to those kinds of laws might uh, might look okay. Maybe uh, that's one reason for differentiating between different kinds of religion. And we have a comment back in the back. I would like to get your uh, view on this because I don't know <coughs> how it all breaks down, but as this gentleman pointed out, there, and as you've pointed out, there's a lot of variety of views within religion. It's not a monolith, Wh whereas we tend to, or at least I tend to look at maybe atheism or evolutionists who tend to kind of see things all in one way. Is, that, uh, is there a lot of diversity of thought as how they approach the same types of nuanced things that we do as, quote, religious people? Um, or is, is their thinking very similar? I don't know if I expressed that question very clearly, but. Well, actually, there are people who are not religious, but who um, see a value in religion. Uh, there are people who are not religious, but who say they could be persuaded. I was just listening to um, a philosopher that was on um, the Discovery Institute, who's an atheist, who's arguing that intelligent design should get a hearing. And when you listen to him, you find out that what he's saying is, well, I think that on balance, the evidence appears to support atheism, but I could be wrong. Uh, there's a definite possibility that I could be wrong, and uh, and uh, it's a certainly a worthy question. And uh, that's not the kind of people that are going to be trying to shut uh, religious uh, opinions down, obviously. So yes, even within atheism, there are shades of opinion. The one that seems to have control over atheists right now tends to be a more um, 
uh, shall we say, vigorous view. Uh, but it's, uh, but that may be an artifact of control rather than an artifact of how people actually believe. And in fact, I, I wonder if that's not part of what's terrifying the people who hold that view is that they might lose control of the, uh, of the discussion. Uh. <clears throat> In my dealing with, with scientists out there at meetings, etc., I, I think you're right. There, there's a fear that we're going to lose. At, at one discussion about creationism at a at, uh, Geological Society of America meetings, one of the geologists says, we're going to lose this, you know, and he was just plain afraid. Um, and so there is that. There's, there's all kinds of opinions among people, but there's kind of this, in some sense, official view that is very dogmatic. You, you cannot, will not allow any questioning of it. But there's evidence that there are people in science who don't know how to respond to that or are afraid to say anything, but they don't agree with it. There's probably a lot of those out there. Go ahead. Um, Paul, could you go back to a uh, slide uh, where you, um, oh, maybe about a third of the way through, you talked about empirical evidence. I, and then you, you started to give illustrations of Yeah, counter exams. It was a slide just before. The, the, this one here? Um, yes. The, the bottom part. Yeah. Scientific and historical hypotheses arising from and or compatible with supernaturalistic philosophy sometimes have considerably more empirical support. And uh, it seems to me that much of the rest of your talk uh, relies upon a definition of what you consider to be empirical evidence. Could you clarify for me what is and what is not empirical evidence? Well, empirical evidence it comes in uh, basically two flavors, uh, one of them being scientific evidence, uh, where you do experiments in a laboratory, let's say, and uh, the results always come out one way. And uh, repeatable. Uh, repeatable and measurable and uh, so with intolerances you can say that this is what you expect um, uh, and that's you make the assumption that where you haven't tested it the law still applies um, and that's scientific evidence um, scientific evidence would I think include uh, at least partly you know how our bodies function uh, partly what we can expect from, let's say, non-living matter and living matter and the fact that the latter has not been observed to, to come from the former and that, uh, uh, that that becomes the law of biogenesis uh, from which one expects either no or else <coughs> extremely few exceptions. Um, and the more we know about life, the more it would appear that, in fact, it's no <coughs> exceptions um, without some special outside help. Uh, the other kind of empirical evidence that I'm talking about is historical evidence. And the reason, the reason I make a di differentiation between those two is that if you want to find out where Alexander the Great went, it doesn't do you much good to set up a laboratory and have some soldiers fighting. Um, well, this, this is what my question because it seems to me that um, from s making this statement, empirical support, you then did go l to a, a significant extent into historical evidence. I would not, um, I guess I'm uncomfortable with including historical evidence under the category of empirical. I'll, I'll buy that historical evidence is, is evidence of a particular nature and requires it to be evaluated 
and corroborated and multiple uh, sources and documents and things like that, but I'm, um, I'm uncomfortable with considering it as part and parcel of empirical evidence. Well, empirical evidence is the evidence that you run into. Okay, it's, it's distinct from theoretical. That's the division that I'm trying to make. I, I would go with your initial <coughs> description, that is that it's, it's evidence that you can get by setting up in a laboratory and it's public, that is, you get it and anyone else who follows your description gets it and it's uh, evidence that appeals to, the, to sensory input. But I'm uncomfortable with putting historical evidence in the same category. Maybe I'm unusual in that regard. Well, uh, let's, let's try it this way then. Because um, I think this is an important point. Uh, because one of the questions that will come up is, is everything that's empirical historical? Or, or pardon me, is everything that's empirical scientific? Um, if, there, if there is some kind of history, okay, for example, this talk is recorded. If you want to, at the end of it, uh, probably late uh, this afternoon, you'll be able to pull it up on the internet and you'll be able to look at it again and uh, you'll be able to see what happened and there will be very little question as to which words I used in a particular setting or which words somebody else used. It's all recorded there and it's objective. It's objective in the same way that uh, and if there's somebody else who has a cell phone that's recording this, uh, you know, on the side, there we'll get slightly different views of the thing. But we'll, but the, uh, uh, but you know, the words that are said, the expressions that are made that are recorded, are are all objective in the way that you could set a bunch of people there and ask them what words were used, and they would all give you a transcription that would within reasonable tolerances be identical. Um, so to me that's objective evidence. Well, if you want to call it, <laughs> if you don't want to call it empirical, I'm, I, I, guess, no. I guess what I'm trying to say is that, that in my book anything that is you know, open and public becomes in a certain sense empirical evidence. Um, it's something that can be checked and it's something that can be agreed to by all kinds of people regardless of their biases, as long as their biases don't just completely force the issue, you know. I've lost the microphone. Uh, yeah, let's uh, <laughs> <laughs> let, let's get it, get it back to him. Right. <laughs> uh, okay. I agree that it's objective, but I, I'd like to make a distinction yeah. between empirical and objective. Uh, reality is so much more complex than our simple definitions. I think it's hard to draw a line between what we call experimental science and historical science. If a paleontologist is working on some bones in his laboratory, is that historical science or is that empirical? Uh, well, part of it's empirical okay. science. You can measure what sure. percentage of uh, calcium is in the bones. It's both. And it's both. It, it's, it's really not a, an easy line. I mean, you know, we, we, have, we talk about uh, historical science, which is not the science that the historians use in their methodology. It is uh, that science that we feel is not as objective as experimental science where you can repeat things. Uh, it's, it's more uh, on the speculative side, but there's no sharp line between these two. It, uh, and uh, we're... we're uncomfortable with the past uh, compared to the present, we should be, I think, to a certain extent, because we, we can't repeat it. Uh, it, it yeah. But uh, we have to work with a continuum between these two and uh, uh, do the best we can of what we have. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, that uh, what we're dealing with is objective evidence. If you prefer that to empirical, I, I would say I could understand that. But that's an argument over words, not over concepts, I don't think. Well, it is, an, if, if in fact um, the uh, 
because I, I think that most of the instances you cited would qualify more as historical, probably objective evidence, uh, than it would qualify as empirical, scientific, repeatable, uh, publicly available, um, and... Well, it's publicly available, but just not necessarily repeatable. Okay. That's... Uh, publicly available does not necessarily mean... Uh, well, by publicly available, I meant uh, empirical in the sense that uh, if I describe an experiment that I've done, and as you well know, being a scientist yourself, uh, nobody really believes that something is so until other laboratories, preferably even in um, other countries, in other societies, have been able to reproduce the results. At that point, uh, generally, science will say, yeah, this is probably something that we can rely upon. It's kind of a no, uh, one study is, is no study? Uh, one study is an interesting, uh, <laughs> interesting, yeah, interesting guide to what might be the case. But somebody's been very patient over there. Yes. Go ahead. Two facets uh, to this one is uh, how a number of the individuals who are archaeologists have used the Bible to identify certain mounds to look for certain things, and then they have discovered in those mounds. Uh, such as uh, the one in Samaria, where they discovered all of these tablets and clay things of a library that uh, gave information of a whole bunch of in individuals who were named in the Bible, who were thought to be uh, figments of people's imagination. And here are the shards that had all these names on them. And the second is the uh, uh, Saint uh, you know, Helen experiment up there in uh, Washington. A, uh, geologist who is uh, from an outside university was looking at the different things that occurred there to the uh, geology at uh, Saint Mount St. Helens and he admitted that uh, this uh, un unusual event uh, basically because of the rapidity with which a number of things occurred basically uh, could re require a total rewriting of our geology textbooks. Uh, I think that's fair, and, I, and I'll come back to this because I think it's a really important point to discuss, um, and that is, is looking at what happened after Mount St. Helens, is that science or is that history? <laughs> uh, uh, looking at what happened after Mount St. Helens, I would say is empirical evidence. I, I don't have any question about that. Okay, so if that's empirical evidence, then is looking at what happened, uh, let's say, with um, uh, Alexander's conquest, is that empirical? No. Uh, if you've <laughs> 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 but you, you've got somebody else that wants to go in a different direction. Eagerly. <laughs> May I suggest that all research is really looking for information. And our laboratory experiments, we, we try to design in such a way as to maximize the signal to noise ratio. And the closer uh, control that we have on the greater number of parameters in the experiment, the more improved that ratio is in favor of gaining a better signal-to-noise ratio, thus learning something substantial. However, as we lose control on an increasing number of parameters involved, one of which may be time, thus things could be further and further away in the past, we naturally can expect a larger noise and a lower signal-to-noise ratio. It doesn't mean that the signal is completely lost necessarily. Sometimes it might be, but sometimes there may still be ways to glean worthwhile information regardless of how distant or how tenuously uh, regulated the experiment. The issue, therefore, is 
how large is the noise that we have to contend with. And the further back in time we go, the larger that can be the noise that can be expected naturally. And, and also sometimes the smaller the signal because of you have course. less information, period. That's right. Many other confounding factors come in the way. But that doesn't mean that no effort should be expended to learn something or, or try to uh, uh, gain some understanding of some kind or verify something. It, it just means that we have to understand what we're dealing with. That, that's all. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> going back to the empirical and objective or you know, all these definitions, I just point out that in, in none of this are we talking about absolutes. The time of Galileo and Copernicus, there was empirical evidence to say that heliocentric theory was wrong, part of the evidence. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, there were things in molecular biology believed that were based on a, a solid body of empirical evidence, and now known to be wrong. Um, science is always a search, always a growing process. Whatever we believe at this point in science is a progress report on where we are in that search. And we, know, we don't know when new evidence will completely, completely change our understanding of previous evidence. And so it's a fascinating thing to do, but, but it never are we talking about absolute. And that, of course, is true in history. One of the things that we, we started out with is the legend that Galileo went to jail, which turns out to be mostly, if not in, completely incorrect, and the legend that he was tortured, which also turns out to be completely incorrect. And yet, if you had read the documents from the period, that's what you would have come away with thinking. I would just suggest the only absolute is what God gives us. Yes. Uh. Um, we could go through the scientific method here, and it's outlined in different steps. One of the steps is testing. Y you take an idea, and then you launch it, and you test it, and quotes the real world. But sometimes the real world is different than just the world you're looking at around you. Um, I'm testing some ideas now in 19th century thought, and I'm looking at creationist ideas and see how the ideas panned out in the writings and thinking of uh, various scholars, scientists, lay people, even theologians in the 19th century. And you can kind of winnow ideas down and maybe um, find ideas that are more fruitful and ideas that are less fruitful. If you go to the 20th century, early at 20th, you have Einstein wh who used a novel approach for testing and that's through his thinking processes. He actually did uh, thought experiments, as you know. It was, it's mind-boggling. We don't have the mind of Newton, any of us here, but he was able to test ideas in advance of their actually being launched, and when they looked at eclipses and different things, they could start proving aspects of the theory of relativity. So there's a dual aspect of testing. One is in Newton's thought and brain, the other is in the telescopes of the astronomers, and, and the both correlated. Um, I would say with my testing of ideas in 19th century thought and history, uh, that's only first step. Then you have to go to the world around you and do further testing. So that even testing has different stages to it. Well, the interesting thing is that history can be tested too. That's a point I wanted to make. I'm glad you, that's what I was saying, yeah. That, uh, for example, uh, you can make predictions based on various theories, and then you can go back and look at original documents from the time and, and ask, what is it, uh, you know, what kind of evidence does that give to or for or against the, the theory that you're testing? And I think that's one reason why I have a hard time dry, uh, drawing a really fine line between uh, uh, between science and history yeah. in that, uh, uh, you know, there are some scientific experiments that are essentially historical. That if you do certain kinds of tests for, for example, a high blood pressure medicine, even though theoretically they're reproducible, in fact, they will not be reproducible because nobody will ever give the grant money to do that big a study again. And uh, so, uh, 
so in practice, even uh, even scientific studies sometimes turn out to be uh, non-reproducible in in uh, in practice, even though they are in theory. Another footnote about testing: my friends, archaeological friends at Andrews at the Horn Institute of Archaeology, they actually swear by the scientific method. It works with archaeology. You develop hypotheses. You go out and you dig and you test and you have little pieces of potsherd that are mentioned here. Um, you're looking at empirical evidences and historical, and you're trying to blend them together. That's, that's a big challenge, but uh, that is following the scientific method as far as I can tell. Yes, we have a question here. Maxine Green, a number of years ago, wrote an article called Messing About in Science. And she suggests that the scientific method that we talk so much about really comes late in the process. That there's a lot of messing about, a lot of conversations, a lot of looking at this and looking at that before the scientific method is even put into play. So I think we should be just a little bit cautious about sticking totally to saying everything that I did was within the scientific method when you may have spent several years messing about first. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that there's even more than that, and that is that there are sometimes when the scientific method is apparently directly helped by something that at the bare minimum is totally unscientific and at the, um, at, at the outside is actually inspired. I'm thinking specifically of uh, the discovery of the structure of benzene, uh, which reportedly came after a dream that a chemist had of a uh, molecule that bit its tail and started spinning around. And, uh, and uh, Kikuli made the proposal for the benzene molecule based on that, and uh, that, that proposal has borne out um, uh, fairly strongly. I think it's you know, one of the foundations of organic chemistry. That came at least from a dream and uh, I think it's fair to say that it's possibly that it was a divinely inspired dream. Um, and so the insistence that everything has to be um, you know, cold and calculating, I, I think, is, is just wrong. Scientific hypotheses can rise from anywhere and they can be, uh, they can, uh, 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 they can be validated or not, as the case may be. Uh, that science is not limited to the scientific method considered as a, a cold uh, 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 just a de novo a hypothesis by, by the investigator, him or herself. That sometimes the hypotheses come, can come from all kinds of places, some of which other people might think were crazy, but it doesn't matter. If they bear fruit, then they're good. And a dream is not a public matter. It's very, very private. That's right. Uh, and nobody can go back to Kikuli and say, well, um, I didn't see that dream. It didn't happen then. Um, I will note that it is uh, now just a little past 11.30, and I know that some of you have places to go, so um, we can continue the conversation if people have questions, otherwise we can, we can call it quits now. Okay, it looks like the, we're done then. <laughs>